we'll just start from the Amen. Amen. I want to start by asking you all a question, and I'm not looking for an out loud answer, but as I read a series of scripture verses, I want you to already be thinking about this question. How do you see yourself? As a sinner or as a saint? Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Psalm 51, verse 5, Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. <clears throat> Romans 3.10-12, As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, there is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. In Isaiah 64, verse 6, All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf, and like the wind, our sins sweep us away. Who's feeling good? All right, our good acts are like filthy rags. Not one single person is good, and we've been sinful since conception. How do you feel about yourselves this morning? How do you see yourselves as a sinner or as a saint? More importantly, I want you to ask this question now. How does God see you as a sinner or as a saint? In the Catholic Church, there's a long process for formally becoming a saint. But we're not Catholic. They seem to have a corner on the sainthood market. And to be a saint... According to Catholicism, you have to die first. There are no living saints, according to the Catholic Church. And like I said, you have to be Catholic to be a saint. So no Martin Luther, no Billy Graham once he goes. But this sermon isn't about what the Catholic Church believes about being or becoming a saint. We're living and we're in a church building not controlled by the Pope. So let's just forget the Catholic qualifications and just talk about saints for a minute. What qualities do you think of when you think of a saint? This one is an out loud answer type question. When you think of a saint, what are some qualities that come to mind? A sneeze? Dan Klein, what comes to your mind when you hear of saints? Somebody who follows the direction of God. Okay. Kindness, gentleness. Okay. Anybody else got any ideas? All right. Well, you're probably not thinking of actions like quarreling and arguing, pride and boasting, people taking each other to court, getting arrested and thrown into prison. Is that safe to say you're not thinking of those qualities? If you can't think of some qualities, you're not thinking of those. But those are all issues dealt with in one of the 14 letters that St. Paul wrote to the church. That's from 1 Corinthians. So all of those issues dealt with himself as Paul was arrested numerous times for preaching the gospel or the church that Paul was writing to. This sounds like a pretty messed up group of people, not what we would consider saints. But do you want to know how he started the letter? <clears throat> to the church of God, which is at Corinth... To those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, saints by calling. With all who in every place call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. He calls them saints as he deals with their quarreling and arguing, pride and boasting and suing each other. They are saints. They sinned and so did Saint Paul. The same St. Paul that led a rampage against the Christian church before he himself received faith in Jesus and was murdering Christians for being Christians. The same St. Paul that in 1 Timothy 1.15 calls himself the chief of all sinners. The same St. Paul that our church is named for. Let's look at another of Paul's letters to a church since we're a church and we're trying to figure this all out. In the book of Colossians, we hear about a church that takes their sins so seriously and devastatingly that they were beating themselves and starving themselves, not thinking, not thinking that the work of Jesus on the cross was enough to get them into heaven. Now, I don't know of anyone here, I guess you could be hiding it really well, but I don't know of anyone here that is beating themselves or starving themselves, being so distraught over their sin. 
But these people in the Colossian church were literally beating themselves up over their sin. And so I'll paraphrase Paul's message to them by quoting Pastor Mark Driscoll. He said, sin, sin may describe some of your activity, but it does not define your identity. Sin may describe some of your activity, but it does not define your identity. You may feel guilt about things in your past. You may even feel guilt about something in your present. Whatever you feel guilty about may describe some of your activity, but in Christ it does not define your identity. Now you may be thinking that that's just incorrect because I don't know what you've done or what you've been through. You're right that I probably do not know exactly what it is that makes you feel guilty rather than saintly. But I understand the fact that you do feel unforgivable or that you may feel unforgivable. However, to hold on to what God has let go of, you're essentially saying to God that you are wiser than Him. If He is willing to forgive it and to redeem you and you are not willing to forgive it and be redeemed, what else could you be saying? If not that, then you're saying that what Jesus did on the cross was not enough. And if what Jesus did was not enough, then God believes himself to be stronger and wiser than he is. And therefore, you think that you can see a weakness in God that he has not seen in himself. And therefore, you are still saying that you are wiser than God. Romans 5 verse 8 says, While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Still <coughs> sinners. While we were still sinners. Christ died for us. On the cross, Jesus knew what he was dying for. While Jesus was dying, he knew who he was redeeming. While he was dying, Jesus knew who he was giving forgiveness to. While Jesus was dying, he knew who he was giving eternal life in heaven to. And do not forget that eternal life in heaven is eternal life with him. You won't get to heaven and see Jesus roll his eyes over the fact that you got in and he has to put up with you for the rest of forever. Jesus knew who he was dying for and willingly died in your place for your sins so that your guilt could be gone and you could spend eternity with him. It was an intentional thing. Colossians 2 verse 6 to 14, this is what Paul said. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in Him, rooted and built up in Him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and in Christ you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. In him you are also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self ruled by the flesh was put off when you were circumcised by Christ. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. When you were dead in your sins, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. In Matthew 4, we hear about Jesus being tempted by Satan. Jesus had fasted for 40 days and nights, and Satan came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Does anything stand out to you about what Satan said to Jesus? If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. This is another of those out loud answer type questions. All right. He was trying to get Jesus to question his identity. If you are the Son of God. Satan tempted Jesus two more times after this, each time starting with, If you are the Son of God. 
By yourself, by ourselves, we fall short. We are sinners on the way to hell. Every single one of us. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our sins, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. That's from another of Paul's letters to a struggling church. Ephesians 2, 4-7. to Baptized in Christ, made alive with Christ, forgiven by Christ, we are heaven-bound saints. Not because of what we've done or do, but because of what Christ has done for us. If you believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior and Redeemer, you're a saint. Know who you are, both in yourself and in Christ. Because in Christ, you are a saint. Yes, live well. Yes, try to live a good life. Try not to sin. But in the words of Christian music artist Trip Lee, the good life is the life that's been laid down. It's not about what you've done, but about what Jesus has done for us. We have to lay our lives down at the feet of Jesus. It's not about what you've done. It's about what he has done for us. Now, this is the gospel, is it not? This is the good news. I have one more bit of good news this morning. Paul went on in Ephesians 2. I just read from Ephesians 2. He went on to say this, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Who's heard that verse? Oh, come on. Yeah, there we go. Some of you. All right. So the New Testament was originally written in Greek. And the word that we translate to workmanship, it says, For we are God's workmanship. The Greek word for workmanship is actually incredible. It's awesome. Does anybody know what the Greek word is? You may have heard this before. The Greek word used that we translate to workmanship is poiema. Does that sound like any word in our English language? Poiema. Still drawing blanks? I need to shave my head so I look like Pastor Craig. (laughs) Then you guys will answer. Poiema. Poem. I heard heard Diana Stallman say poem, I think. Nice work. All right. So from poema, we get our words poem and poetry. So it could say this, For we are God's poetry, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We are God's poetry, created for good works. We're not the leftovers of something that God really wanted. We're not just scraps left behind from some other creation he had. We are handcrafted with an intentional love by the one who made hands to begin with, to be saints. I'm going to say that just one more time. I really want this to sink in because, especially in the Lutheran church, I grew up Lutheran, so and I, I know how it goes sometimes. Um, I know that it's easy to get down on guilt, to stay with uh, all total depravity and not realize who we are in Christ. We are handcrafted with an intentional love by the one who made hands in the first place intentionally to be saints. If you are in Christ, you are a saint. Some of your activity may be sinful, but your identity, who you are, is a saint in Christ. Will you please pray with me? God, I thank you for you. I thank you for your love for us, and I thank you for your grace for us. Let us feel it in our bones, the impact that your love and grace has on us. Let it impact us in such a way that we cannot live for ourselves any longer, but will spend our lives showing the same grace and the same love that you've shown us. In Jesus' name, amen.